This video is brought to you by June's Journey, a free-to-download hidden object mystery game set in the 1920s. You are stronger than you believe. You have greater powers than you know. Our era's three most high-profile female-led superhero films, Wonder Woman, Captain Marvel, and Black Widow, are all tales of empowerment. In that way, they're a departure from many older female superhero films such as Catwoman and Elektra, or even Black Widow's early MCU appearances, all of which relied more on sexy aesthetics than a dynamic narrative. She is potentially a very expensive sexual harassment lawsuit if I you keep ogling her like that. But how deep or nuanced is the picture of female empowerment presented by movie's biggest superheroines? Discussions of Wonder Woman, Captain Marvel, and Black Widow often led to the question, are these films feminist or not? But that query doesn't have a simple answer. A more useful question to ask is how each movie presents feminist ideals. I think this film is incredibly diverse, it's intersectional, and it's about um, overcoming suppression. Here's our take on the feminism of modern day superhero films and the blueprint they present for delivering super empowerment to all women. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe and click the bell to be notified about all of our new videos. Like a lot of mainstream cinema, Wonder Woman, Captain Marvel, and Black Widow tend to portray empowerment as a largely individual process by highlighting the development of strength and heroism in a singular character. That character is depicted as exceptional, in many ways elite or separate from most regular women. I'm the man who can. And though she does work to help other people, her movie journey is mostly about character growth, thus potentially making feminism feel more like a personal struggle than a collective one. Captain Marvel's origin story aligns with a type of mainstream popular feminism that is all about overcoming obstacles to achieve success. As Carol gets back up after being knocked down and doesn't take no for an answer, the implicit message is that a strong individual woman can fight through barriers to forge her unique pathway to success. Near the end of the film, though, Carol begins to use her powers to partner with the refugee aliens, the Scrolls, in their battle against the Kree colonizers. I'll help you find a home. And here, her movie starts to express the ideals of third wave feminism, an outlook which emerged in the 1990s that's defined by an emphasis on multiplicity and difference, coalition and community. Star Brie Larson said that Captain Marvel is all about intersectional feminism, a term coined by Kimberly Crenshaw in 1989 to describe how gender, race, class, and other identifying factors intersect and overlap to create different levels of discrimination and privilege. African-American girls are six times more likely to be suspended than white girls. That's probably a race and a gender problem. It's not just a race problem. It's not just a gender problem. So even if the film spends most of its time focused on her personal empowerment, it concludes with her taking on a mission other than and different from her own. You found my family. Feminist philosopher Amy Allen defines three types of power, and these definitions can help us to better understand the different forms that empowerment can take. The first type of power is power over, which is defined as the domination of others. Can you imagine what I could do with the veins you're under my control? The second type of power is power too, which represents individual empowerment within a static system. The third, most radical type of power is power with, which represents people working together to resist or subvert unequal systems. We can see this progression between the three forms of empowerment in Captain Marvel. While working with the Kree military, Carol exhibits power over, using military strength to squash the resistance. At this point, Carol has been taken in by the concept of post-feminism, that is, the idea that a strong woman like Carol doesn't need feminism. She's living in a technologically advanced world where her gender doesn't seem to have stopped her advancing up the military ranks. But that post-feminist myth is debunked, and Carol has to reject the idea that feminism is no longer necessary once she realizes all the ways she has been controlled and held back. I've been fighting with one arm tied behind my back. But what happens when... I'm finally set free. Carol uses power too when she defeats Yon Rog and the other Kree who captured her, exhibiting individual empowerment. I have nothing to prove to you. But then, near the end of the film, as Carol begins to use her powers in conjunction with others in need, this represents the start of a power with mindset. We just want to hug. You and I lost everything at the hands of the Kree. While Captain Marvel ends with these third and fourth wave feminist values, 
Wonder Woman follows the opposite trajectory. It starts by depicting a third-wave feminist utopia through Diana's life on Themyscira, where her fellow Amazon women have raised her with exceptional self-sufficiency, confidence, fighting skills, what do these women wear into battle? and never to experience shame or insecurity. In this opening, the Amazons wield their strength in a power with capacity, working together for collective empowerment as they protect themselves from men. However, Wonder Woman actually moves away from explicitly feminist ideas as the film goes on. In the end, when Diana fights her nemesis, Ares, at the height of her power, she is totally alone, separated from her community of Amazons. She displays power over in this final showdown, dominating Ares Goodbye, brother. and fighting on behalf of humanity rather than with them. Black Widow builds on Captain Marvel's model and likewise moves toward a power with ending. It goes even further in attempting to make a feminist point about broader systemic oppression. When Natasha Romanoff and her sister, Black Widow Yelena Belova, conclude their story by literally destroying the system that has harmed them so much, simultaneously freeing others from its control. It took my childhood, it took my choices, and tried to break me. But you're never gonna do that to anybody ever again. Those who are freed also come back to support their fellow widows, even though it would have been safer for them to run away. You came back for us. We need to be honest, Abby. In different ways, Captain Marvel, Wonder Woman, and Black Widow all put forward the idea that empowerment comes through knowledge. There's so much. So much you do not understand. In Captain Marvel, that's self-knowledge. My name is Carol. Carol starts out already powerful, but she can't access her powers and become fully empowered until she learns who she really is, battling the loss of her history, memory, and identity. Meanwhile, at the start of Wonder Woman, Diana is already in full control of her powers, but like Carol, she must learn more about herself in order to become an empowered hero. In Black Widow, Natasha learns more about her family and the role they've all played in the Red Room, which in turn gives her the knowledge to destroy the Red Room and make peace with her past. So, in different forms, all three films embrace the maxim that knowledge is power and illuminate tactics of disempowering women by depriving them of education or a sense of identity. You stole me from my home, my family, my friends. Like Carol and Diana, Natasha begins her solo movie already physically empowered after a lifetime of training to be a super spy and assassin, even if she doesn't actually have superpowers like the other two. Natasha's isn't even an origin story since she's already an Avenger. The focus is on her achieving emotional catharsis, Svani, my mom and Kaya sister. which will lead her to become a better hero and Avenger. But since Natasha's story was already finished through her death in Avengers Endgame, the impact of her emotional empowerment is limited. In fact, the more dramatic empowerment story in Black Widow focuses on the younger generation of women in the MCU, especially Yelena's journey. I've never had control over my own life before, and now I do. I want to do things. Even though Black Widow and Captain Marvel end on a power with note, it's worth noting that much of their screen time is still on power too, or individual empowerment, prioritizing choice and individuality, fighting and overcoming obstacles. If no one else will defend the world from Ares, then I must. And finding oneself. So they don't really go all the way toward depicting with depth what kind of collective empowerment might look like. Even within Black Widow's story of destroying the Red Room, most of the Black Widows don't actually have a voice. Overall, our heroes are still individuals operating primarily on the symbolic level. It's about what you believe, and I believe in love. Next up, how these superheroes fight sexism. But first, I want to take a moment to highlight the sponsor of this video, June's Journey. It's an incredible hidden object game that's free to download. It combines everything I'm looking for in a game, or any other kind of story. A strong female lead, a compelling mystery, and stunning visuals. I'm completely addicted. The game centers on June Parker, an amateur detective in the Roaring Twenties, and I'm obsessed with her grit and determination when it comes to solving the mystery of what happened to her murdered sister, Claire. Each scene of June's journey is beautifully painted with intricate details and hidden clues for eagle eyes to spot. And in addition to its captivating mystery, the game is super relaxing, which is especially great if, like me, you spend all day trying to be the superhero of your own life. We all need to unwind sometimes, and playing June's Journey is how I do that. The game is available on Android and iOS mobile devices, as well as on desktop computers through Facebook games. So download June's Journey for free by clicking the link in the description below and let us know your theories on the central mystery.
Diana, Carol, and Natasha are all super women living in a man's world, often explicitly fighting against the forces of sexism. Carol's empowerment journey is directly linked to overcoming sexism. She grows up being discouraged by her sexist father, then joins the Air Force where women aren't allowed to fly combat missions and are constantly looked down on by their male peers. You do know why they call it a cockpit. By the end, Carol has learned from her history of dealing with sexism, and this knowledge and experience powers her in the final battle. Black Widow presents much darker and more extreme examples of female oppression. The Red Room, the organization that trains Natasha to be an assassin from her early childhood, takes little girls from their families in the hopes of making them elite killers known as widows, murdering those who don't make the cut, and forcing hysterectomies on those who do. Unfortunately, these storylines parallel the all too real problems of human trafficking of young girls and fights over women's reproductive rights. The greater point underlined here is that in this world and still too often in ours, females are treated as disposable. I can finally come out of the shadows using the only natural resource that the, the world has too much of, girls. Captain Marvel and Black Widow both illustrate the popular feminist connection between injury and capacity, which feminist scholar Sarah Benet Weiser argues is one of the defining characteristics of popular feminism. Feminist campaigns working to build confidence in girls and women often define female empowerment as the process of overcoming injury to achieve full capacity. But while this type of feminism is meant to inspire and empower women, it can again focus on individual resilience while leaving oppressive structures intact. Try, fail, learn, keep going, hashtag like a girl. And can even inadvertently suggest that hardship is good for a woman's potential. Carol has been injured in many ways, the loss of her memory, the brainwashing at the hands of the Kree, and the sexism she has experienced throughout her life. I made you the best version of yourself. What's given can be taken away. But the film portrays these setbacks as things that have made her stronger and more powerful. Likewise, Black Widow and Natasha's arc leading up to it emphasized how much Natasha has been injured and what she has had to overcome in order to become a hero. Natasha, too, comes around to this what doesn't kill you makes you stronger thinking. Pain only makes us stronger. Didn't you tell us that? And in this way, her film suggests she couldn't have become the Black Widow and the Avenger we know had she not been so deeply traumatized. Throughout her MCU history, Natasha has arguably been too defined by her experiences in the Red Room. For much of her Iron Man 2 and Avengers appearances, we don't really get to see much of her personal journey apart from moments that underline either her past trauma, I got red in my ledger, I'd like to wipe it out, or the fact that she is beautiful and can manipulate her beauty. So Black Widow's message about fighting an oppressive establishment that hurts girls and women is complicated by how much this figure has always been shaped by male creators. Black Widow was introduced in Iron Man 2 as a sexy spy who poses as a lingerie model. Did but you, you model can't in Tokyo? Because she models in Tokyo. And in her early appearances, she was a male fantasy of the strong, sexy, cool woman who may be better than the guys in some ways, but always knows she's there to support and not truly outshine them. I'm always picking up after you, boys. In Black Widow, directed by Kate Shortland, we can see the character story trying to grapple with this history. Why do you always do that thing? Do what? The thing you do when you're fighting. This, this thing that you do when you whip your hair. When Yelena jokes about having a hysterectomy. Is it your time of the month? I don't have a uterus. Or ovaries. This feels like a direct correction to outrage over the scene in Joss Whedon's Avengers Age of Ultron when Natasha voices that her infertility makes her a monster. You still think you're the only monster on the team? As Natasha concludes her story by destroying the patriarchy of the Red Room, it's as if Natasha the character, too, is trying to break free of her history. The problem, though, is that because Natasha is canonically dead in the story that follows, this feels like a redemptive project for a character who didn't get that journey to empowerment and still can't really define a journey that's already complete. Wonder Woman, meanwhile, is almost a hypothesis about what a woman would look like if raised in a world without men, if she came into this world already empowered. Diana isn't held back by sexual difference because she doesn't even understand it. She's not aware that she's stunningly beautiful, nor that sexism or other forms of oppression exist. Not everyone gets to be what they want to be all the time. Me? I am an actor, but I'm the wrong color. But from this starting point, Wonder Woman's messages about sexism are at times contradictory. 
The first Wonder Woman film is set during World War I, but while it does acknowledge the sexism of that time, I do what he tells me to do. Yeah, well, where I'm from, that's called slavery. Diana herself does not really face it. She doesn't need feminism for herself. And though the film does not quite depict a post-feminist world, because sexism and racism are at least touched on, it distances itself from a more direct feminist message by the end. A choice each must make for themselves, something no hero will ever defeat. Director Patty Jenkins has even said that Wonder Woman is not feminist, but rather a universal character. But while the idea that we could all be like Wonder Woman if we never experienced sexism is appealing and captivating, the film doesn't provide much of a concrete blueprint for feminist empowerment or change in our world. Moreover, where she's supposedly a hero to women, in her film she primarily interacts with men and is even put at the mercy of men's superior human knowledge. When she meets Steve Trevor, he becomes her instructor in the world of men. Is this what people do when there are no wars to fight? They're this and other things. In fact, a dialogue analysis done by scholar Pete Jones reveals that Steve has the same amount of dialogue and narrative centrality as Diana. This is made even worse in her sequel, Wonder Woman 1984, wherein Steve is brought back to life and again made into the central focus, <laughs> thus lessening Diana's narrative control even more. In the first film, after Diana's faith in humanity is destroyed and she doubts if humans deserve her help, Diana must choose which viewpoint to adopt. Steve's? It's not about to serve our it's not it. Or her mother's. Be careful in the world of men, Diana. They do not deserve you. In the end, she chooses to listen to Steve. It's not about deserve. Apart from how all three superheroes interact with sexism, it's also interesting to look at how their powers relate to their womanhood. Both Diana and Carol use their emotions, which are more often associated with women than men, to access and trigger the full force of their superpowers. On Hala, Carol is indoctrinated with a male-centric idea of logic over emotion, taught to suppress her emotions in order to be a better fighter. There's nothing more dangerous to a warrior than emotion. But as the film continues, Carol learns that her emotions are the key to her power. Wonder Woman has always been a notable superhero figure for embodying traditionally feminine ideals like the power of love to save humankind. Only love can truly save the world. Natasha in many ways fits a more traditionally male idea of strength. Her power or heroism is not typically connected to her womanhood, except in that, as we've seen, she's been defined by the misogynistic trauma she has faced, like her hysterectomy. They sterilize you. One less thing to worry about. The one thing that might matter more than a mission. The lessons she's internalized about how to survive in a man's world are also largely not that useful for imagining a new way of structuring our world and social relationships. Still, in Black Widow, her heroism, too, is tied to her emotions, specifically her ability to keep her empathy in the face of psychological conditioning that was meant to take it away. Tell me, how did you keep your heart? Both Captain Marvel and Black Widow also center the protagonist's relationship with another woman, emphasizing the significance of female friendship and sisterhood in women's lives and success. Carol's best friend, Maria Rambo, the person who knows her best in the world, is Carol's anchor to her past and her real identity. You are Carol Danvers. And Maria reminds her, and implicitly all women, that empowerment is not actually dependent on having superpowers. And you were the most powerful person I knew, way before you could shoot fire from your fists. Superhero movies do tend to present a fairly generic narrative of empowerment. The series The Boys sends up this trend through its fictional Girls Get It Done superhero promo campaign, which underlines how the girl power used to sell female superhero characters can often be glib, superficial, and a little boring. Don't worry. Girls get it done. To be fair, it's not the job of movies to teach us about social or political theories. But it is important to think about how movies that are labeled as empowering or feminist actually depict these narratives on screen. Even if individualist narratives may be symbolically powerful, they need to go further in order to provide an actual model for how progress might be made in the real world. Representation matters. Diverse storytelling matters. The female experience matters. As audiences keep demanding higher standards of representation, these superheroic depictions of feminism get progressively closer to reflecting a relevant real world feminist message, one that can empower the hero in all of us. Every woman 
has the potential of being something extraordinary. This is The Take on your favorite movie shows and culture. Thank you so much for watching and for supporting us. Please subscribe and never miss a take.